Well, I didn't think of myself as doing comedy. I thought of it as doing just representing life, like I witnessed in the old apartment house where I grew up. There were 40 apartments, and I would go to every apartment and hang out and do whatever they were doing, talk the way they talked, do whatever they did, so that I could hang around. Hi, I'm Lily Tomlin, and this is a timeline of my career. Oh, gracious, hello. Have I reached the party to whom I am speaking? Is, is this General Motors? Hi, General. How's everything at the Pentagon? So tell me, how's Mrs. Motors? I was in New York doing a music scene on ABC, and the uh, offer came in to go on Laugh-In. I didn't really want to be on Laugh-In. I didn't want to do anything on television. I wanted to be in the theater. So I went and met with George, and I loved him so much. He was so great, and he seemed to understand what I was doing or what I liked to do, and he hired me. Last Thursday, Miss Pickett wet the bed, and we thought she'd outgrown that. When I first pitched Edith Ann to the writers and to the whole staff, they didn't really like her. They thought she was too bratty, and uh, so I had to do her out of a refrigerator box the first couple of weeks, and then she caught on. I was touring with uh, Dan and Dick from Laugh-In, and we were staying at Adele Webb, and I went down in the lobby, and there was a little girl there. She was about four years old. She had a big toy snake, and she said, my snake needs, needs to take a bath. And anything that ended with the TH, she blew a raspberry, she'd say, we have to go visit my Aunt Ruth. <laughs> I lifted that raspberry from that kid. Oh, you could say, I, you could say, love you. Uh -huh. Or you could just say, I'm happy I met you. Bob Altman and I had the same agent, and one day, uh, Altman called me on the phone, and he said, uh, I want you to do this part in Nashville. And I said, why do you think I should play this part? I said, I could play any part in this. And I thought a lot of the other parts were much more interesting. But when I got down there, I saw, I watched all the other actors come in, and I thought, I must be more like Linnea than I realized. We were only in, uh, in the movie maybe five or six minutes, each actor, because there were so many of us. My parents were Southern, they were from Kentucky. So I had a lot of trouble uh, reconciling that my character sang in a black church and all that stuff without any social pressure. This is a long time ago. This is 1975 or so. I came to understand that they thought because I had deaf children, I identified with the disenfranchised. That gave me a great insight into the, uh, into the role. What did that feel like when you got the nomination? Well, I, I was elated, you know. It was my first movie. I had so little screen time, and I thought it was one of those, just a fluke, but um, I was grateful for it. How can you smoke those things? Let me have a drink. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm no girl. I'm a woman. Mm -mm. I am your employee, and as such, I expect to be treated equally, with a little dignity and a little respect. I was the one of the three that, did, that was known to do comedy, and I... I had I took exception. I didn't think a lot of the lines were that funny. I adored Colin because he'd written the screenplay for Harold and Maude, and I thought that was divine. Of course, the first day I wanted to get out of it, I thought I was terrible. I'm talking to birds that aren't there and a spoon that's in the air and all that stuff. And then the second day I saw I saw the dailies and I would, thought I was pretty good. So I said, I'm back in. <laughs> anyway, it was just craziness. I smoked a marijuana cigarette at a party once. I, I could never figure out what the big deal was. I, well, I was a huge fan of hers. I rocked a uh, clued hairdo for a couple of years. So I was very excited when she came to see my show at the Amundsen in December 79 or something. And then the movie came out in December of 80. We did not know the movie was going to be such a sensation. Hey, Violet, where are you going? I'm going to get drunk. At a girl. And that was fun to do. We played mismatched twins. 
and they'd have to lock the camera down and then do it with our doubles. We'd have to go and change clothes and all that stuff. And they'd say, come on, hurry up. You've got to get back here faster. I said, well, give us a cash incentive. Give us like 10 bucks. The, whichever one of us gets back the first, we get $10. I said, that would be enough to stimulate us to hustle it a bit. Did they give you the $10? No. <laughs> they thought I was kidding around. Oh, you've seen too many movies. You get back. You just get back. Oh, yeah, that was great. I, I got that bracelet. They put it in my costumes, and I saw that bracelet, and a friend of mine was there, and I said, look this, and she said, it's like a, it's like a rattlesnake, and, I, and a snake figured prominently into my character because I was from the South, and I was like uh, kind of, you know, did some snake handling, but they never really spoke of it. <laughs> But I carried a Bible and all that stuff, so I'd shake that bracelet, and I'd, I know, and you know, they didn't want me to do that, the producers. I was so mad at them. I said, one more take, just let me do it once. There is no such thing as pot people, is there? You're not my sister. I am now creative consultant to these aliens from outer space. They're a kind of cosmic fact-finding committee. Amongst other projects, they've been searching all over for signs of intelligent life. It's a lot trickier than it sounds. My partner, Jane Wagner, wrote it. That's how it came to me. <laughs> I was touring all the time doing shows, one-nighters, and I didn't want to do them. I said, if I could only stay in town a little longer because I'd get a great review and I'd have it, I'd be leaving that morning. I'd be reading it in the airport. Oh, my God. And I'd take off. So uh, I decided to, to go to Broadway and legitimize myself. And that was a huge hit. They called me from Scholastic, and they and they offered me that job. And I said, oh, God, I'm not good at any kind of voiceover. If I'm not in the moment doing something, I don't think it works. So I said, I'm going to send you a tape and see if you think it's OK. Because I didn't want to get a job that they're not happy with it when they were offering me the job. And they, they would get stuck with me in the sound recording room, you know. And so that was fun. And I was very happy I did it because um, well, it was just wonderful to do a, a woman science teacher and to do science in general in a teaching tape like that, which was highly esteemed by readers. And uh, and uh, kids and people used to drag their kids. They'd say, oh, Miss Frizzle, wait a second. And they'd bring the kid about five or six years old, and they'd look at me, and I don't look anything like Miss Frizzle. And then they'd, they'd get behind their parents' leg, and they'd hide them. It's sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid? Mm-hmm. It's a deadly poison. People in our family have had small children at the time, and they would sit in the living room with me, and they'd see Miss Frizzle would come on, and they'd listen to it, and they'd look at me, and they'd look back, and they'd say, now you say it. <laughs> it was hard getting notoriety for my deeply felt role as Miss Frizzle. Up, up, and away! I'm going in, okay? Hey, Josh, no. I'm sorry? It's the senior staff meeting. I'm senior staff. You don't have your briefing memo. How do you know I don't have it? I'm sorry, do you have it? No. Catherine was a friend of mine. I'd met her on Murphy Brown. She came in as one of Murphy's secretaries, kind of thing like where the phone would be ringing and Murphy would say, are you going to answer that? And she says, does it look like I'm going to answer it? And uh, so she was real cheeky and wonderful. And then she, she got killed on West Wing. They didn't replace her for a whole year. And then they replaced her with me. And that, and that was great fun. Everyone who loved it, uh, I mean, we just hated it that Jed Bartlett was not our president. I guess Bush was our president at the time, George W. But you wanted Jed Bartlett to be your president. And, and when we had to give the Oval Office up to Jimmy Smiths and his team, I was crying like a, a, a fire hydrant. And I had to go off the set and come back, and I, I felt like it was so real that I was turning over that office to that girl that worked for Jimmy Smiths, and I just wanted to choke her. <laughs> it was great to be on that show. It was wonderful. That's a fair point, and next time I'm going to remember the memo. I'm confident you will, because you're going to remember it this time, too. 
You want me to go back to my office and get it? I do. There's nothing too small. You know, when police find the slightest bit of DNA and build a case on it, if we might see you, you floss or masturbate, that could be the key to your entire reality. So I'm hiring you to spy on me. That's right. It was great. It was fun. It was outrageous. Uh, of course, a lot of other stuff happened on that set that was outrageous. I mean, I adore David O. Russell. He's the director and the writer. And he could really do no wrong as far as I was concerned, although he did plenty that was bad. And he misbehaved, I mean. I mean, he would jump rope outside on the set in his underwear and just a load of stuff. He was always up to some business. And he and I got into a big fight at one point. It went, it went viral on uh, the internet, but that was early in the internet. I was doing an interview with the, my, the Miami paper at one point, and they said, well, what do you think of the, the video? I said, I don't know, what video do you mean? <laughs> And I, that's how I found out about it. But it didn't bother me that much. I mean, things happen on the set, you know. And all my friends were saying, you're not gonna work with him again, are you? I said, in a heartbeat. What is this, some kind of shakedown? I need water. You cannot drive until you get your license renewed, ma'am. Oh, come on. We're like six blocks from the guy we're stalking. No, 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 you shouldn't tell me that. Someone asked me what my favorite episode was, and I said, the first and the last, because the first was just so formative, and I had a great moment at the end of it when we're having the peyote uh, ritual at the beach, and I, I, was, I was crying, si you know, kind of silently, and, and Jane said to me, why couldn't you, why aren't you mad at your husband? Or, and I said, I'm not mad, I'm heartbroken. So I just knew in that moment that uh, there was more to the series than we had any idea. And fast forward seven seasons to this last episode, it's just so wonderful. And that, that, that sequence was filmed so richly and so tenderly and funny and, and it was everything we had hoped for uh, to end the series and to have Do uh, Dolly with us was great. You just play for the medium. I, you know, even in the theater, you don't play it that broadly because you want the words to carry it. And so the words are there and they're that solid and beautiful for the character. Most comedians, if you, if you speak to them about it, they say, it's just one, another point on the continuum. You play it, you, we have comedy here, you could play it as broadly as, as, the, as the material and the style allows and drama here, you, you know. It's just how it is.